Hello and welcome back to the podcast. In today's episode, this is the final episode with Brittany. It's been a while, but it's been absolutely amazing to re-listen to Brittany's story and I'm almost going to be sad that this is our last episode together. So this is an incredible episode. It is a bit long, I know, but honestly, it is worth every listening minutes. It is such a journey that Brittany's been on. In case you don't know, this is episode three with Brittany. So the first episode was a conversation we had about everything that Brittany learned to unlearn and all societal beliefs, especially regarding births and so on. Episode two is the first two birth of her two sons, where Brittany went through her first birth. She birthed with an OB and the second one she birthed through an MGP program and this is Brittany's third son's birth where she actually she was wanting to have a home birth and she had put her mind to it she was going to have a private midwife she was going to birth at home and she was gonna going to have a medical professional there things didn't work out that way and because Brittany was living so remotely having a private midwife meant that she would need to drive 10 hours and stay at an Airbnb for an undisclosed amount of time. It meant being away from her home, potentially being separated from her husband who, because he was managing a cattle station, couldn't just take leave for a month. This, along with other signs that Brittany had received from the universe, really led her down a path of choosing to have a free birth. And what Brittany takes us through is that she didn't just wake up one day deciding to have a free birth. She thought about it really carefully and she actually only made the decision to free birth when she was 30 weeks and she accepted that her circumstances meant that it was actually easier to free birth logistically than to have a home birth. With that, she takes us through the incredible circumstances that happen on the day where she went into labor and the fact that her doula, who was going to be present, had to drive from Brisbane, so 10 hours away, to hopefully make it to her birth, because if you listen to it, there was floods during that time. So this is a really incredible episode. It is an amazing conversation. I am so happy that we spent four and a half to five hours recording this and that I was able to piece it all together and really share the depth of Brittany's knowledge and insights. It has been absolutely incredible and I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. You are listening to Kappa with a Doula. I'm your host Alicia, exercise physiologist and doula and every week I chat with a mom or mom-to-be about all things pregnancy, birth and parenting. The stories you will hear in this podcast are real and sometimes real, but they are all told without any taboo. So grab yourself a cuppa, put your earphones in, relax and enjoy this episode. So did you always want more than two kids or as you said you know was the fact that you had such an amazing postpartum you had you know you reflected on your birth and you you had this sense of empowerment of I can do it on my own I don't even need you know the the medical system to be present did that I guess play a role in you conceiving baby number three Yes. Yes, it really did. And I feel like if I had maybe had a repeat of birth number one, there would be definitely hard conversations about not having any more kids because Mm -hmm. there's no way that I would have been able to experience that two times and be okay afterwards. And even though my my second birth was something that kind of people would classify as like not being okay um, because maybe – if situations were different like people would go I'm I'm I ain't going through that again you know I'm not going through a secret labor and an almost shower birth and a falling down in front of on the lawn and you know almost giving birth in the gutter with the cigarette butts around them and you know a a lot of people would be like I'm not doing that again however I feel like the situations around my second birth 
and especially in my postpartum, it enabled me to heal and feel so much more empowered that I was like, hell yeah, I want to do that again. And definitely I feel like working a lot on my inner my inner childhood journey and doing a lot of reparenting and doing a lot of gentle attachment and aware parenting has actually made my parenting journey of two children, it made it actually really enjoyable. So like having two kids Mm -hmm. was really, although like, of course, there's challenging moments, of course, in parenting is really challenging moments. But it was like the more that the more healing that I kind of did around my own birth and my own my own childhood and my own upbringing, the more healing that I did with that, the more actually empowering and fulfilling parenting became for me and my my mothering like I felt like Mm -hmm. this almost like an unstoppable force you know of of just like Mm -hmm. um overwhelming mothering energy and so and and birth Mm -hmm. plays into that like a hundred percent the way you birth and how you birth plays into the your mothering experience and so yeah of course there was like some trepidation around mainly the fact that we had we had moved so remotely so between the my second birth and conceiving my third we had actually moved into the desert basically which is leads into my next conversation so there was some maybe not trepidation but there was like some considerations about having a third baby and Mm -hmm. how would that look and you know how would Mm -hmm. I go to like antenatal appointments and things like that so there was a bit of consideration there and however it it was like let's let's do this again like it's so fun and it was so um like empowering and so deepening that we were like hell yeah let's 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 give this a go like for sure and so I guess for me it was a very interesting experience conserving conceiving my third child I was actually involved Mm -hmm. in a national horse competition at the time and it was a very Mm -hmm. big competition that I was preparing for to compete my to compete my horse in and um I remember being like should I get pregnant in in this in this and but (laughs) it like the pull to be pregnant and the pull to have a baby at this time was just it all felt so right and it all felt like it's kind of now or never kind of thing like I don't know why we sort of Mm -hmm. have these these thoughts in our mind but it was like no it needs to happen like now and and everything else will take care of itself Mm -hmm. and so I actually became pregnant whilst I was preparing for this major major competition and I actually competed (laughs) one whilst I was 18 weeks pregnant and um it was yeah it was such a it was such a beautiful and empowering experience to also do that However, it was like I was so glad when the competition was over because all through my first trimester and half of my second trimester, I was like riding every day and it was high level. And I actually won this massive competition whilst I was pregnant. But I was no way. I was so, so happy to like drive the wow. 12 and a half hours back home, put my horse in the paddock and just be like, okay, I can be a mum now. Like I can just... I can just relax now. I can I can just go into the mothering portal. So yeah, that was that was a really also empowering experience and something that I was like, mm. yeah, I yes. I feel like real I had so much energy and I felt like really really I can I can do anything. I felt like I was on top of the world. And also the duality of motherhood you know I had all the feelings around like I can't wait till this is over so I can just put my feet up and just be a pregnant person and not have to worry Mm -hmm. about (laughs) all all the rest of the things so uh yeah it was it was so interesting and and like I said yeah we live quite remotely so um there was so much travel involved in that first trimester Mm -hmm. like I was traveling you know 12 and a half 14 hours two competitions because I live so far and so um yeah I was so happy when that was over (laughs) um as much as I enjoyed it and as much as it was um the most empowering experience I was very glad to uh to to finish it as well but 
However, I became pregnant, as I said, preparing for this massive competition. And I was like, okay, yay. Like, uh, I'm, I'm so excited to be pregnant. All right. What, what do I do now? And it was so interesting yeah. because I lived on the border of Queensland and New South Wales, very far west. And okay. I dro- I technically, I lived in Queensland, although like New South Wales yeah. was like just there. And I, I drove to New <laughs> South Wales because I just ha- had been going to the town in New South Wales often to like do my shopping and stuff. And it was where yeah. I knew. So I just was like, okay, I think I want to get a private midwife. Like I, this is what I think I want to do. I want to mm-hmm. get a private midwife, but I need it obviously – I need a GP referral to get a private midwife. So I Mm -hmm. drove to New South Wales. I went in there and I said, hey, I'm pregnant. And he said, how do you know that you're pregnant? And I was like, I I know that I'm pregnant. This is my third pregnancy. I've peed on like five sticks. (laughs) I know. And he was like, well, we can have to do a pee test. And I was like, okay, but I'm telling (sighs) you that I'm pregnant. So I don't actually need you to do that for me. And it was such a different experience from my first, which I was like, oh, my God, like I can't wait. Like tell Mm -hmm. me and, you know, all these blood tests and everything. And I was like, look, I all – I'm literally coming in here because all I need you to do is give me a referral. I don't actually need any of your care or your confirmation or like anything. And Mm -hmm. what usually happens in outback towns is we never have doctors that stay very long because they come out from the city and they come all the way out into the outback and then they're like, oh, my gosh, this is kind of not what I thought I was coming. You know, why the heck am I here? Or sometimes we get like super (laughs) dodgy doctors that like can't really get work Mm. anywhere else and they end up like out in the middle of the boonie. So he said to me, Okay. okay, so what model of care are you going with? And I said, Um, you know, like I live in Queensland and he was like, well, I don't know anything about Queensland because this is New South Wales. So unless you're going to birth in like the hospital, that's like 12 hours away. I actually, I can't like give you a referral to anybody else. And I was like, well, actually, yeah. So there's, I, I I don't know if you guys are kind of aware, but there's like a weird kind of a bit of a non-communication kind of thing that happens between states in Australia. (laughs) And so he he wasn't actually able to give me any information about like the hospitals or the midwife program or any kind of like antenatal programs in Queensland. He was only able to give me the information Mm -hmm. of those in, in New South Wales and like, there's no way that mm-hmm. I was going to go to a hospital in New South Wales. So mm-hmm. I just said, look, I don't actually but care. So, sorry to cut. No, did, right. So did you have a hospital, like a Queensland hospital nearby you So and a 12-hour away hospital in New South Wales? Is that the situation? I had a – I wouldn't say nearby. So I had a Queensland hospital okay. that was probably four and a half hours away from me. And okay, he wasn't yeah. mm-hmm. able to, like, give me any information about any of the yeah. maternity. And I kind of wasn't, like, aware that by me going to a New South mm-hmm. Wales doctor, it wouldn't he wouldn't be able to give yeah. me the information that I needed for Queensland. I just never really yeah. thought of that. But I didn't actually really care because I just wanted a private midwife. No. And I was like, yeah, I knew, that's right. I knew that's that right. I wasn't going to be engaging in the public system because I had really mm-hmm. made a decision that that's what I wanted to do. So mm-hmm. I had I had already picked a private midwife, the, the only one that I knew that was okay. actually 12 hours away from my house also. But I was like, it's okay because mm-hmm. I called her up and I said, like, I literally paid on a stick yesterday. Mm-hmm. And she's like, yeah, I've got heaps of Outback patients that just travel to me. And um, they just get like an okay. they just get an Airbnb close by, and then I just yeah. I've I've birthed heaps of babies from women in the bush at Airbnbs. Like she goes, I can even tell you some of the good Airbnbs okay. around by, and I was like, oh sweet, yeah, let's do this. I'm keen, <laughs> cool. no problem. So I go to this GP and I said, I, like I don't care about anything you want to say. I just want you to give me a referral for this lady. Like this is her name. Can you? And he said, oh, you're not having a home birth, are you? And I was like, yeah. And he and he goes, well, <clears throat> I'm actually a retired obstetrician and I, oh. I don't support home births. And I said, oh, good. Okay, but I don't care. Like, I just want you to give me the referral. I don't care whether you agree with it or not. Um, you don't actually know me. Yeah. I don't know you. You know, there's – and he was like, can you tell me about your first and second births? And I was like, no, I don't really want to and I don't really think that this has anything to do with 
this conversation. He goes, well, I, I just won't write a referral for a, for a home birth. And I said, luckily mm. I had done enough research. And I said, well, you can't actually not. <laughs> yeah, I said, you can't. You're not allowed to. You have to. What did you find in your research? Yeah. So they legally have to write a referral because you're asking for it. Is that what you found? Unless that they have grounds to refuse so unless that there was like literal medical evidence to say like you know Brittany Mm -hmm. is type 2 diabetic or she has like insane postpartum hemorrhages or something like that so that that unless there has to be reasonable grounds for them and he didn't have any reasonable grounds because he had he didn't (laughs) know me and then he starts telling me Mm. just all these horror stories about home births and also just women in general, he said. I and I said, "Oh, that's interesting. Why did you stop becoming like? Why did you stop practicing as an obstetrician?" And he said, "I just, I just mm-hmm. people just wouldn't stop suing me. Like I just got so many lawsuits. Like I just couldn't keep practicing. You know, someone sued me for like malpractice because apparently I did. Oh. There was no c- consent around, you know, a um, pap smear that I had done, and I was just sitting here, like." in his office going, you're telling me that you're not going to approve me for a home birth and in the next breath you're telling me that you have multiple lawsuits for malpractice out against you. And I'm just like, I'm I'm in an alternate universe. And I was just like, look, I, I don't really need to hear about any of these things. Um, Can you just please write yeah. me this referral that I've come, you know, I've driven two hours for you to give to me. Mm. It was like pulling teeth. And he said, all right, I'm going to do it, but I'm not happy about it. And I was like, okay, I understand this, but, like, I need it. It was such a ridiculous experience that I was having. And it and it wow. really, really, really proved to me that, like, I was at war. I felt like I was walking into there yeah. having a battle. Yeah. I was literally having a battle. And, he, and him and I were like at each other's throats and it was this really yeah. tense experience where I just had to be like, no, I know what I need and I know what I want and I know what I'm allowed to have. But only because, mind you, yeah. I had done my research and I had gone into the depths of the, you know, the dark underwebs of women that, you know, start advocating for themselves and they talk about yeah. these kind of things. Yeah. And unless I had I had done this, there'd be no way. I'd, I'd just be like, okay no problem, like I'm not allowed to. I would have gone straight back into my first birth where I was the good girl and trying to be the good patient and trying to be the one that wasn't causing an issue and, you know, so I I wouldn't, there's no way that I would have been able to. Eventually I left with this referral under duress. (laughs) Oh, oh, that is amazing to hear. I am just in awe of you. Like, so, you know, coming back to your big competition Mm. that you absolutely killed Mm. and you're four and a half months pregnant Mm. and you're you know we know the first trimester is is so hard to to get through yes and you know so energy consuming and so on and then you walk into this this doctor's office and you know what you want and that is amazing you know you know we we talk a lot about advocating these days and it's hard to advocate when you don't know what you want because sometimes you don't know what you want Mm. that makes sense Mm -hmm. you know just like you said Mm -hmm. if you hadn't done your research you wouldn't have known so it's not it's not always on the woman to to go oh funny I had known because some you don't know what you don't know Mm -hmm. I say that all the time yes but you 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 don't so good on you you did your research and as you said you know sometimes you you just have to to fight for what you want because when you're being met with no, and as you said, there is no grounds, this dude has a belief that home birth is unsafe, it's a no-go, it shouldn't exist, and so on. And he comes, and, and on top of that, he's an obstetrician mm-hmm. who's being sued for malpractice. Mm-hmm. I mean, that just adds another yeah. layer to it. <laughs> but but when his grounds for refusing is personal belief, mm-hmm. that's not good enough. That is not good enough because at the end of the day, the person that will be basically deciding whether a home birth is the right option for you or not is actually your private midwife. Mm -hmm. So you can get a referral from a GP. And as you said, if your private midwife would then do an assessment and she would, you know, get your medical history and so on. And if she finds out that, you know, you've got some 
I guess they're called risk factors, like as you said, type two diabetes or type one diabetes or you know anything, you know a- any other things, then she may or may not basically be able to support you because obviously she has she has to respect certain practices and guidelines to be an endorsed private midwife practicing in Australia. Yes. So I mean, it's not up to the GP to to say, oh. No, I don't want to. I don't want to refer you for for a home birth. Basically, based on my beliefs that a home birth is unsafe. Yeah. Like, no. And how insane is this fight where you you do walk out with the referral? Yes, <laughs> that is so good on you. Yeah, because honestly, as you said, you know, it's it's easy to go. <sighs> okay, well, I just won't get it this time and maybe I'll have to go and see another GP or, okay, well, I just can't do a home birth and yeah. so be it. You know, it's it, – we, we're in a society where a GP or a medical professional, we believe, holds so much weight and wisdom mm-hmm. in what they're saying to us that if they say no, then the answer is no. Mm-hmm. But the answer isn't always no. Sometimes, as you said, we have to do our research and we have to question and say, well, why are you declining this referral? Why can I not have a referral for home birth when, well, I'm pregnant and, you know, obviously you know your history. It's not relevant to him. It's relevant to the private midwife. Mm. And why are you doing that, you know, and and just questioning it. And that's how you found out he was a retired (laughs) obstetrician with a lot of... You know, <laughs> being sued for a lot of malpractice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's how you get places, and that's what I'm trying to say through this whole uh, rant I'm, I'm I'm on right now. Is advocating for yourself is also asking questions. It's also saying it's it's like challenging their opinions. So saying, but why not? Or why is it that you're saying this? And sometimes I found that health professionals, they they have a specific language mm. that they use. And they sometimes use, you know, words like, oh, I usually don't do this. Or, you know, more often than not, that's not what's being done. And so therefore what they're saying is, oh, I usually don't do that. Mm. Okay, cool. So what I'm hearing is you can't. Because mm. if you usually don't do it, mm. I don't really care why you don't do it. If I want you to do it, I'm I'm hearing you can, basically. So challenging the the words they're saying, I'm finding because yes. they're a very literal person sometimes. So it's like, okay, you usually don't do it, so you can. Okay, yes. Well, let's do it then. Yes, and you know, it actually it caused me, and not that I was conscious of it at the time, but it actually caused me yeah. to embody the woman that I mm-hmm. wanted to be. Mm-hmm before I was the woman yeah. that I was. So I was mm-hmm, shaking mm-hmm. in my boots walking into that doctor's surgery, but I knew that I had to yeah. walk in there with a unshakable energy yeah. and sure of what yeah. of what I wanted. I had two births yes. of evidence of why I didn't want to birth in a hospital. Two births. The hospitals had yeah. two chances and both of them not like no no dice so like I had to walk in there and I had to be the woman that knew what she wanted and and was not going to be swayed from what she wanted before I actually was Mm -hmm. that woman because I didn't actually have any evidence I had evidence why I didn't want something but I didn't have any evidence why I did want it and so that Mm -hmm. like I had to just pretend that I knew that home birth was the safest and best option for me even Mm -hmm. before I'd had a home birth and that was very difficult and and I I kind of talk Mm. about like I read Rachel Reed's book childbirth as a rite of passage Mm -hmm. and I realized that my births were they were birthing like a new version or a new woman of me each time and the Mm -hmm. first one birthed a woman that didn't speak up and didn't and didn't know anything Mm -hmm. and was completely naive Mm. and was very Mm -hmm. at the mercy of um, just other people's agendas. And, like, then my second birth, which was kind of the same because I didn't – I kind of made some different choices, yes, but I was still 
I was still within the system and I was still like Mm -hmm. um, a part of that. And so my births, my each of my births kind of birthed a new version of me as well. And however, I was having to like embody this like badass mum that was like advocating for herself even before I was that badass mum because I didn't have any anything to kind of go off only what I didn't want to have happen and so that was so interesting but I will say one of my most transformative experiences that really gave me evidence that I was like I know I know what I want and I know what I want to do was I actually had a friend who had a free birth, an accidental mm-hmm. free birth that wasn't an accident, but she just mm-hmm. kind of yeah. painted it like it was an accident. Yeah. Rurally, like she lived quite far away from a hospital as well. And I had been chatting to mm-hmm. her and she, she'd she had this free birth kind of around the same time that I just fell pregnant. And she, and she was like okay. communicating really intimately about it. Like, oh, I think my labor's starting. And I'm like, are you going to go to the hospital? And she's like, mm-hmm. actually, no, I'm not going to go to the hospital. And, you know, she messaged me a bit later and she's like, oh, I've just sent my husband away. I've just sent my kids out of the house, you know. And so I was like intimately invested and involved in this this birth of my friend, of her of her baby. Yeah. And she's sending me pictures and and then she sent me a photo like an hour later and the, and there she is just holding a baby and she's sitting on her bedroom carpet. And I'm like, wow. And so I had this woman, this actual evidence then of this personal person that I knew and that like we had this really trust-filled relationship that I was like, well, if she can do it, I can do it. Like there's absolutely no reason why yeah. like I can't do this this thing that I want, although I'm going to get a private midwife and I'm going to do it differently, but she didn't birth in the hospital. I'm not going to birth mm-hmm. in the hospital. It's totally fine. Mm-hmm. She added me to a Facebook group called Wild Pregnancy and Free Birth. And when she added it, added me to it, I was mm-hmm. like, what is this hippie BS? I am not here for this. Oh, my goodness. It was so, 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 like, way left field for me. And I was so mainstream. Even though I was kind of advocating for myself, I was like, no, 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 no. Like, this is next level. I could – it it triggered me so much that I couldn't even look at it for a while. Like, every time one of the posts okay. would pop up on my feed, I'd, like, have to quickly scroll by it because I was like, no, we we don't do that here. Like, that's – I'm still gonna uh-huh. I was still kind of one foot in the one foot in the mainstream camp where I was like, I'm gonna have a midwife and I'm gonna do this and blah blah blah. So yeah, and then so she added me to that group. She showed me her her pregnancy, like and I was kind of intimately involved in her pregnancy. And then yeah. I got my referral for my private midwife and then she sent me this care package of like probably seven books that she had collected through her pregnancy Mm -hmm. the first 40 days was one of Mm -hmm. them childbirth without uh, child childbirth without fear home birth on your own terms childbirth is a rite of passage Mm -hmm. and there was a few others that that she sent me as well and and she sent me this package like right around this time that I was doing the competition and I kind of couldn't really and then I then I started to sit down and read them and they just having one yeah. woman in your circle and one woman in your corner was so powerful. Yeah. Like, honestly, her belief in me was all I needed. Mm-hmm. And she lived in a different state. Like, we were we were so far away from each other. But just having one woman that that had been there, had walked the path and, and was like, I've got your back, was enough for me to kind of yeah. – it, it planted a seed of belief in me that yeah. I realised, well, actually, like, her and I aren't any different. We're the same, yeah. you know. It was her third baby, my third baby, you know. Like, it was it was really empowering having somebody just checking in on me. And I think that she always mm-hmm. knew that I could free birth, and, but she there was no way that she would yeah. ever suggest. She just planted the seed and she was yeah. like, oh. So, meanwhile, I'd finished my horse competition. I'd won it. Like, it's all great. And now I get to go into the birth portal and I get to experience Mm -hmm. preparing for my birth. So to paint a picture for everybody, what that birth actually in my mind 
had to look like was I lived 12 hours away from mm-hmm. Brisbane. My private midwife was mm-hmm. in Toowoomba. Now, if anyone knows where Toowoomba is, it's mm-hmm. it's like kind of not far from Brisbane. It's like a, like an hour and a half inland from Brisbane. Yeah. And so I still had to travel like I'm going to say 10 hours to Brisbane. And I was like fine yeah. with that. I was like, cool, it's going to be like a baby holiday. We'll We'll go there. We'll get an Airbnb. We'll have a baby. It'll be yep. fine. And a few yep. weeks later, we did the drive to Toowoomba because I was having like my probably my one and only antenatal appointment with my private midwife. Mm-hmm. And I got there. We hired an Airbnb. Like it was so great. She came to the house. She she did all the things, and it felt so good. Like I was like, yes, I can't wait mm-hmm. to give birth with this woman as my guide. You know, it's going to be so awesome. Mm-hmm. I can't wait. And she she said, there's only one scan that I want you to get, and that's your 20-week scan, just to check your placenta placement, mm-hmm. and the and I'm fine without anything else, without any other antenatal appointments. I've checked you okay. once, you know, third baby, you're fine. And I was like, okay, I can mm-hmm. do that. Went for my 20-week scan the next week, mm-hmm. and all was on track until I had to have a thought about, no, 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 hang on. So if my last birth happened in two hours at 38 weeks, mm-hmm. 38 and three, A, how do I know when this baby is going to come? It could come at 38 weeks because I had two babies come at 38 weeks. However, yeah. I forgot to mention that I had stretch and sweeps with both of those just for no good reason okay, other yeah. than it seemed like a good idea to do at the time and, and my cervix yeah. must have been ripe and uh, whatever. So I'm like, okay. So I had stretch and sweeps with both of my last babies. So if I don't have a stretch and sweep, which I wasn't feeling like I wanted or needed one, then potentially Mm -hmm. my baby could come at 42 weeks. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to drive 12 hours away at 37 and a half weeks just to settle Mm -hmm. in and make sure I'm there for 38 because 38 was my, like, I've got two babies that have been born 38 and two. So, and then I've got two toddlers. I'm going to have to sit in an Airbnb for an undisclosed amount of time that possibly could be a month. What if I, what if my baby Mm -hmm. is born at 42 weeks? When is my husband going to come? He doesn't Mm -hmm. have a month's worth of leave and even if he did have a month's worth of leave banked up that does that mean I, we need to drive home like the day after I give birth so I need to sit in a car yeah. and drive 12 hours back to my house like the day after I've had a baby yeah. and I just started to mm-hmm. really sink into what that looked like I was like rattling around an Airbnb waiting for myself to go into labor does a watch pot ever boil What is my husband going to do? Mind you, my husband is managing by himself a $20 million cattle station. He can't just take off for an undisclosed amount of time Mm. with no staff and no support. Like there's just the Mm -hmm. actual logistics. I was totally in my my masculine head of the actual logistics of me being like, whoa, hang on, this this actually does not mm. compute. That I can't actually make this work in my brain. Mm. So I sat with it and I sat with it and I felt more and more uncomfortable about just how to actually manage the logistics without being induced for convenience, which I did not yeah. want to have happen. I just didn't. I'm like I don't feel like that feels like the right thing to do after all the kind of the learning I've done. I don't just want to like give my baby some exit notice because it feels convenient for me to do that because of distance Mm -hmm. and time. So Mm -hmm. I sat with it and I became growing more and more and more uncomfortable with the Mm -hmm. logistics of it. And I finally broke down at about maybe 30 weeks and I said, James, to my husband, I don't know what to do. Like I'm I'm actually playing out mm-hmm. the labor in my brain and I'm playing it out and I can't make it work. And he just said, why don't we just stay home? And I was like, couldn't you have said that 10 weeks ago? What? I, I, although, <laughs> couldn't he have said that 10 know, weeks ago? I know, like, right? I know. <laughs> However, like I feel like he's kind of just going along with like all of my things because he was just facilitating mm-hmm. whatever I wanted to do, you know. And okay. he just mm-hmm. said, why don't we just stay home? And 
it blew my mind. And I'm like, what? You mean out in the middle of nowhere? You want me to have a baby just out in the middle of nowhere? And he goes, well, you pretty much did it by yourself last time anyway, Brittany. Like he came in within five minutes. We almost had him on the front lawn. He goes, I've delivered how many calves before? He said, I watched you give birth. I watched it all happen the yep. last time with no help. He just blumped you up on the bed and here baby yep. falls out of you. He goes, I know you can do it. I've seen you do it. I've seen, <laughs> I've, he said, oh, my daily job is to deliver babies, cow babies. He said, I know yep. how birth works and I know that birth yep. works best undisturbed. And he knows, I know that if mm-hmm. we move you, no one's going to have fun. And potentially you're going to interrupt the beautiful hormonal matrix of labour and you're going to end up at the hospital, which is the Mm -hmm. last place you want to end up at. And I was Mm -hmm. like, I can't even with you. Don't. Just go away. I can't even have this conversation. And I actually went into this, like, mind explosion. I cried. I I shook. I was like, Brittany, what? you don't actually realise the gravity of this decision that you're making. You are going Mm -hmm. to go Mm -hmm. against everything that everybody knows, Mm -hmm. that everybody agrees with, that everybody will tell you is safe and okay, Mm -hmm. and you are going Mm -hmm. to say, F the world, this is what I'm going to do. Are you okay with that? And are you okay with walking the path of, and this is something that I talk to people a lot, potential baby death in this experience and not a lot of people talk about that a lot Mm -hmm. of people talk about all the beautiful things about birth and everything and I had to take a few days of like I had to sit with that and I really 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 had to like get that in my heart that potentially Mm -hmm. with birth with any birth hospital birth home birth Mm -hmm. free birth any birth At the time that we are walking the journey of birth, we are also equally walking the journey of death. And I had to be, Mm -hmm. I had to like come to terms with that. And I realised that babies die in hospital as well. Babies die at home as well. And just Mm -hmm. being in hospital doesn't actually increase my baby's chances of survival. And in in my case, I'm not saying it never increases the chance of survival. Like don't mm-hmm. don't take my words to the extreme there. But actually I have actual evidence of my own personal experience that putting myself in hospital has actually not helped me and not helped my babies. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. like and I don't want to get into the like let's ba- let's bash the medical system because that's what not what I'm here to do. But I'm but I'm also like I had to really sink into myself and be like, okay, if if mm-hmm. that was the outcome, am I going to be okay? Is mm-hmm. this something that I am willing to be okay with? And I was like, yeah. well, my baby could easily die in hospital and I would just be able to blame mm-hmm. somebody else. But if my baby died at home, I would have me to blame because I can't even blame my midwife now because mm-hmm. I – I, I've decided to stay home and I actually had to call her up and be like, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not actually going to come and do. And she was like, fine. Mm-hmm. She was like, yeah, totally. I get it. Like, no worries. You'll be fine. If she was, and she planted a seed of, of yeah. confidence with me there, but I don't want to like, I don't want to say this in a way that's like morbid, but I also want to say it in a way that's mm-hmm. like, this was, I had to actually go through this process in my brain. I had to go through all of those places in my brain to make this decision. And it was a hard road for me. And it took me a few days of like really sitting into this and being like, can I do this? Is this something that I'm going to do? And it probably about four days and of like grief and death and scaredness Mm -hmm. and (laughs) like all of the things funnily enough at that time I started to reach out because I knew that I could get inside my head and I could get very fearful and I could get very Mm -hmm. disempowered and I could start listening to all these terrible stories and have all these terrible thoughts of what if this went wrong or what if that went wrong like whatever And I thought, Mm -hmm. this is a bad place to go. I'm going to outsource and I'm going to look 
for some knowledge to confirm that what Mm -hmm. I know in my heart like I'm going to look for evidence for that and so that Facebook page that I was telling you that I was like I can't even look at that it's I can't even I started to sink into it and I started to look at post after post after post after post of women just giving birth Mm -hmm. I'm like okay so women can just give birth like it just happens and I know it's happened because it happened to me and it's happening to other people and I started reading voraciously all those books that my friends sent me that have been Mm -hmm. sitting gathering dust on my on my bookshelf I read and read and read and I actually decided that I needed a diploma in birth Mm -hmm. basically and so I spent the next 10 weeks obsessively and I mean obsessively researching Mm -hmm. I if I was awake I was listening to a free birth podcast if I was my eyes were opening I was reading a book on birth if I was you know I I was watching videos with my kids I, I I probably watched 15 hours of birth videos of free birth videos and I dedicated like every waking minute that I had to researching birth and knowing birth and becoming like trustworthy in birth and I and I I only shared my plans with a very few select people and like I I sort of came to realize is that this massive thing that we think birth is and this like massive medical event that we think birth is that we can really reduce medical emergencies in birth to like four things and if you can if you can look at those four things and you can be like you know in like the free birth circles we're like shoulder dystocia well for me shoulder dystocia was not a risk factor because I'd had two babies one of them posterior not they did not have shoulder dystocia and so my last baby just basically fell out so I'm not going to have shoulder dystocia it's not going to be my issue the next one was baby resuscitation so I needed to be like okay what if my baby comes out and it's not breathing like what do I do so I did like a whole course on neonatal resuscitation and I started to learn I did like an online course um it's quite good actually and I and I learned like majority of the time you have quite a bit of time because the baby has a placenta, right? And the placenta has, has oxygen. And I needed to like be like, okay, so placenta, oxygen, how much time do I have? An ambulance is X amount of hours away. Actually it wasn't because I had not had an ambulance that was 35 minutes away in a like tiny little town. They have oxygen. I was like, okay, how many babies are born not breathing? Not very many babies are born not breathing. Um, then I had to think about cord prolapse so that was probably one of my only things that I was like all right I need to check when I'm in labor if I have a cord prolapse all right that's never happened to me before doesn't mean it's not going to happen how much time and I listened to heaps of podcasts of women that had had cord prolapses before and like what they did and you know they went in the ambulance with their legs in the air and that kind of thing like all right so I know what to do if I have a cord prolapse no problem And the last one was like postpartum hemorrhage. So I needed to know like what are the risk factors for me to have postpartum hemorrhage? Not great because I've had two babies before and I'm a heavy bleeder, but none of them were classified as hemorrhage. And so I I started researching what do women do about postpartum hemorrhages? And I started realizing that there's actually quite a few things that people do for postpartum hemorrhages. And not every kind of hemorrhage is an emergency. A lot of them are just like wait and monitor and that kind of thing. I'm like, okay. So I started to really arm myself with that. And the other thing I was like, all right, meconium, what am I going to do about meconium? So as you can kind of hear, I actually like empowered myself with so much knowledge. And a lot of people go, they a lot of people do look at free birthers and they're like, wow, you guys are so irresponsible. And I'm like, are you serious? This was my most responsible birth. This was my most empowered, my most informed, my most educated birth that I have, that I've ever had. Like I, I honestly, I felt like I could talk birth for, for hours. I had absorbed that much knowledge. I'd read so much. I, and I'd had, I had so much evidence 
even from like gentle birth, gentle mothering, Dr. Sarah Buckley, and she was like, she's an obstetrician and she had her babies by herself at home because she knew how birth worked and she knew how bir- that birth worked best undisturbed. And that became my mantra. I like, I like sat in my pregnancy just being like, birth works best undisturbed, birth works best undisturbed. And I just kept like knowing this at a visceral like like very very deep level I I embodied that and I began to to live it every day and I didn't tell anyone what I was going to do like I told a couple of friends that friend that I told you a very few and I and I became very absorbed in that Facebook page and I was just ga- gaining knowledge every day I I wanted to interrupt you cool. to say like I'm in awe of this story not because it's a yeah. free birth and, and I'm like, oh, go free birth. I mean, I, I mean, all of this story because the, <laughs> the path you've walked to get to that decision, the decisions you've had to make, the beliefs that you've, you've grown and you've accepted, all the research you've done is amazing. And people bash people who free birth, and I know that. And I have done, I think, so I've got one episode currently about free birth with Jamie. That's my actual first episode. And I've got another one coming. And and those people are the most Mm -hmm. informed birther that you will find out there. Because just like you've just said, there is this paradigm about, yes, I trust my body. I accept everything that will happen which includes responsibility for if things go sideways, which include, you know, baby being born, not breathing, baby having a problem. Yes. The mom having, you know, a hemorrhage or uh, or, or mm-hmm. some form of complication post-birth. And there mm-hmm. is, as you said, you know, if you birth in a hospital or with a medical professional present, that responsibility is handed to them. So it still obviously happens to you or to your baby, but yes. you're not responsible for, you know, what to do. Oh, what do I do? You know, do I do, I do you know, baby CPR just yet or do I wait? That's their responsibility. So you've handed that responsibility when you birth in a hospital or with a private midwife. Yes. When you free birth, that is your responsibility. Yes. And, and those people, unless it's an accidental, basically yes. free birth where, the birth happens so quickly that, you know, it's like, oh, well, the baby just basically fell out of me. <laughs> you know, that happens. Usually people like yourself and, yes. you know, Jamie, who I spoke to on the podcast, um, those people are super informed and they just know, they just know and they have a plan for if things go this way or that way and they just know what to do. Just like you said about, you know, you knew about baby resuscitation, you knew about the ambulance you knew where the nearest one was, you just know. And I think you need to choose a birth option that works best for you. Not everyone is cut out to have a free birth. That's fine. But in your case, because you've got the ruralness, the remote factor, that is a big factor to take into account. And it doesn't mean everyone who's rural needs to have a free birth. But how can you expect a woman to basically remove herself from her environment, drive 12 hours and give birth in a brand new location with someone she's seen, you know, once or twice or pretty much never, you know, if it's just, you know, a midwife when you're in labor. How can you expect that? You know, it's it's not easy, especially when you've yes. got a job, you, you're managing a station on top of it where, you know, the, the cows don't really take a holiday. Mm-hmm. They, they don't really go on break. And, you, you know, you, you can't That's really right. go, oh, yeah, I'll just be away for four weeks. Okay, find someone to replace me. <laughs> like, that doesn't work. So it's, you know, obviously mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you didn't just make yeah. this decision because of your ruralness, because of your work, but you made this decision and you've come a really long way in your pregnancy because obviously you wanted a private midwife, you wanted to be supported by a medical professional. But... The the reality of it is obviously mm-hmm. if there had been maybe a private midwife in your town or you know in a in a nearby town maybe your decision might have been different maybe we'll never know yeah. Australia is so huge and there is such a lack of antenatal and and postnatal care in remote locations I mean 
your only two options were no. private midwife 12 hours away or a hospital that was four and a half maybe if you could birth there or as you said a free birth but mm. even then you know that mm. decision of a free yeah. birth it didn't come oh well I'll just free birth yeah that's no. fine and as you said I agree with that those people are usually super informed because you just know you know you you know your body you trust yes. your body you trust your birth partner you know James your husband you trust your environment but you also have a plan for if things you know, if you start seeing this or if you start feeling that or if, you, if you know, this happens. And yeah. I'm sure you would have also educated James about you need to watch out for a court prolapse. This is what a court prolapse looks like. You know, here is a video of it happening, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and so on, right? And I'm sure he would have done baby mm -hmm. resuscitation with you, I'm sure. And, and, and so it just makes you both... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you will be the key players when, you know, D-Day happens, but it makes you both so informed and so prepared, more prepared than you would be if you birthed in a hospital or with a private midwife, because you have to know what to do, because no one else will be there besides you guys and obviously your toddlers. That's right. Yes. And it, it took extreme yep. responsibility. And the funny thing was, was that mm -hmm. the more research that I did, it yep. actually didn't scare me. It What it actually did was it, was it actually showed me, mm -hmm. oh, birth is pretty uncomplicated. Like it's pretty kind of straightforward. And the more, like the birth after birth that I read, I even, even downloaded and printed okay. out this book called Emergency Childbirth, which was, which was printed by, the American, I'm going to say, it's kind of like the SES, yeah. which is like the state emergency surface. And, mm -hmm. and, and it was printed out as a handbook for people, medical, not medical yeah. professionals, but just like emergency responders uh -huh. in like a hurricane or a flood or some mm. kind of emergency disaster or natural disaster yes. where people would be giving birth. Because people yep. still give birth in like war and things like that. And so I downloaded this handbook that was like what to do if someone's giving birth because obviously these emergency responders will be going into like hurricane bunkers and stuff like that and there's probably people laboring. And I like read it and I was like, is that it? Like this is literally the medical handbook of what to do if someone's giving birth. And yep. it was just so common sense for me. And I was like, okay, so actually my – my research started yeah. to kind of make me super comfortable with birth and be like, birth is so straightforward. Yeah. Bodies are made to be alive and birth is kind of physiologically designed to like bring forth a life. And it'd be pretty evolutionarily crap if humans couldn't give birth without mm -hmm. there being a problem because I wouldn't be here. My, yeah. my grandmother wouldn't be here. My great-grandmother wouldn't be here if birth inherently wasn't something that worked. And so I kind of had to go through this thing and, I, and there was so many layers of deconditioning around like not only baby death that I talked to about before, but then it started layers of deconditioning around like actually I probably know more about birth, mm -hmm. my own body mm -hmm. and my own birth, than anybody because I am a True. expert on myself and I had to like become an expert on myself and like what where does my brain go when mm -hmm. things aren't looking right what do I look like when I'm feeling scared or mm -hmm. when I'm feeling like not okay and I started to it became this this exercise in like knowing yeah. myself and and going within which I realize is something actually what we're all supposed to do coming into birth but none of us do because we're constantly yep. getting our information from elsewhere, from other people saying, you're healthy, you know, you're well, instead of going like, no, I know I'm healthy and I know I'm well and I know how birth works and I know that I'm feeling great. Like I know there's mm -hmm. no pain. I don't need you to tell me that because I already know that. But we don't, we never, we never actually get that opportunity because as I said, you know, the, the layers of conditioning around mm -hmm. other people of the authority in schooling, in life, in medical, in yeah. birth is just so deep. And so it be, it's this big unlearning and relearning of, of so much cultural change, you know. And I, I then went down the rabbit hole of like, okay, so I need to be mm -hmm. prepared for emergencies and I also need mm -hmm. to be prepared 
just generally. So like, what do I need to give birth at home? And I talked to James and I was like, okay, so since we're not paying thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for this private midwife that we could have, do you reckon a doula is a good idea? And he was like, yeah, sure. What's a doula? (laughs) And I was like, okay, so a doula Mm -hmm. is not a medical professional. It's, she's, she's usually somebody Mm -hmm. that knows birth and trusts birth and trusts women, but she doesn't do birth. You know, yeah. she's not the the birthing professional. She's just there to support you to mm-hmm. give birth, to do something that you already know yeah. how to do. She's like an extra pair of hands. And James is like, oh, that sounds handy. And I thought, all right, well, I need to find somebody that would be willing yeah. to come all the way out here into the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. and do that. And so I literally put a post on like that 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 yep. Facebook post that Facebook page that I told you about. <laughs> And I put a picture of me <laughs> sitting in the desert <laughs> and I was like, this is where I live. Is anybody willing to come out here? And oh. nobody responded. Everyone was probably like, and it tests a lot of, a lot of people because if you think about it, those women, those, those doulas are like, well, for them, logistically it's yeah. difficult because probably a lot of them already have families and things like that and um also how much do you really trust birth do you want to be in a birth that is Mm -hmm. so far away from Mm -hmm. a birthing hospital are you okay with it and I'm sure for a lot of people on the surface they trust birth but when it really comes down to it and there's this like reality Mm -hmm. of there is no hospital Mm -hmm. there is no doctor there is nobody around are you okay with it? Until one lady reached out to me and she said, yeah, totally, I'm available. Like, okay. you just have to pay me travel. And I was like, I'm fine with paying you travel. And um, she said, I'll I'll come whenever you call me and um, you just have to provide me somewhere to live, like somewhere to stay for a week or so. And, um, yeah, I'll nice. come. And I was like, great. <laughs> so I got on the I got on the phone to her and I was like, you do realise and I kind Mm -hmm. of articulated what you were getting yourself into, you know. And she was like, yep, no, I'm fine with it. Like, yeah, let's let's do this. I was like, okay, right, okay. Good. (laughs) We've got this. And um, it was the this really really beautiful doula from like Brisbane and her name's um Kelly Hollywood mm-hmm. and she just never questioned me she never questioned anything I, t- I told her that I had printed yeah. out like I printed out this handbook free birth handbook that was like <laughs> if this happens turn to page five if this happens yeah. turn to page six like it was a full-on manual that I'd printed out and I told her and I printed out my birth wishes like right down to mm-hmm. you know what I what underwear I wanted to wear and like I was yeah. like I was like prepared lady and she was like yeah great let's do this she was fine with it and I realized that she like it must have been a big a big decision for her to accept this but she didn't really mm-hmm. she didn't really show mm-hmm. that to me she just showed complete trust in yeah. in what I what I had planned and and anyway so then we had to have yeah. the conversation about like when would she come because I'm like I don't know when I'm going to go into labor yeah. I've never gone into labor naturally like as I said I've had stretch and sweeps for blah blah and she was like you'll know I was like how will I know and she's like no you'll just know I'm like oh this lady trusts me more than I trust myself so the days wore on you know and I'm getting more pregnant and more pregnant and I'm like 38 mm-hmm. weeks hit and I'm starting to look at the the weather and I'm like you don't actually realize that when you live so far away yep. from anywhere the weather actually plays a huge mm-hmm. part in your day-to-day life if it rained more than a few mil she would not be able to get to my house because oh. that I have multiple floodplains between the road and my actual yes. house along the driveway and I knew that she wouldn't be able to access my house if it rained however she's 12 hours away so it could easily rain between when she leaves her house and when she arrives at my house I'm like yes okay this is difficult right no worries so and then I'm looking at the radar and I'm like actually it's raining really hard where she lives and I get on the phone and I'm like hey (laughs) and she's like I know I'm packing the car right now because if I don't leave right now 
I'm not going to be able to get to you because also between yep. Brisbane and where I live, yep. there are multiple flooded places. And you guys remember like a yes. year ago, Australia was basically yep. flooded. That's right. You know, like everywhere was flooding. Is that in and February? She... So my baby was born, oh, my baby yeah. was born on yeah, the yeah. 1st of March. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was yes, horrible. It was in February. We, yeah, I got yeah. flooded in too. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so around the same time, um, she's coming. So this was probably, yeah, like I'm going to say around yep. like the 27th mm-hmm. of February or something like that, that this is happening. And she's yep. deciding when to leave. She's like, I'm packing the car right now. You know, flooding's looking really bad, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh my goodness, okay. Yeah. And she's like, I'm going to leave in the morning. So, okay, all right. And so I'm stressing that night thinking, like, if it keeps raining all night, she's not going to be able to – she's going to be flooded in. Like, she's not going to be able to get to me. Anyway, the next morning she's like, no, I'm I'm on my way. I'm leaving, okay? She didn't tell me that she actually drove through a metre of water outside of her house to get to me. She didn't tell me that until she got to my house. But she was determined to reach me. She wasn't going to leave me. And she ended up not being able to come the most direct way, which would have taken her 12 hours. She ended oh. up having to take a six-hour detour because wow. the most direct way was cut off already by flood water. Yeah, so she left okay. at like, I'm going to say, 4 o'clock in the morning and she didn't get, well, probably even earlier, maybe like 3, and she didn't get she didn't get to my house until wow. that afternoon, like late in the evening. And she just drove like straight. And it was the most like insane experience to yep. be like this mm. lady's trusting me and I'm trusting her and we've we've got this dynamic of she's and she's having to do this massive detour and like it was it was insane and I'm like stressing what if she doesn't get here and anyway so I get off the phone from her and and she's like I'm on my way like it's fine don't worry you just you just you just hunker down. It'll be fine. I'll see okay. you this afternoon. I'll be late, but I'll see you this afternoon. I'm like, okay. Anyway, the phone rings. I'm like, who's this? My husband was out at work, so it wasn't going to be him. Hello, this is <laughs> my local doctor. She said, mm-hmm. I've heard that oh. you haven't left yet. And I said, left? What do you mean? And Because everybody leaves. Everybody <laughs> leaves to go and have a baby, mm-hmm. right? Everyone fly either flies to Toowoomba or drives to Charleville which is the the four hour away birthing hospital yeah. even though there's absolutely no accommodation near there that's remotely suitable and she said mm. I hear you haven't left yet I found your referral to your private midwife and I called her oh. and she says you're not you're not with her anymore <laughs> what are you doing so this is the local GP in the town that's like 40 minutes away and she's grilling me on that day about my birth choices and she's like I'm sorry I can't allow you to do this and I said well I'm sorry you don't get to choose how I birth and she just said I'm I'm not comfortable with this like you haven't told me these are your plans if you had told me I could have you know have you called the ambulance have you called the police have you have you let everybody know that these that these are your intentions? I was like, no, because I didn't let anyone know these yep. are my intentions mm-hmm. because this mm-hmm. is what was going to yep. happen. <laughs> and she said, I attended a fatal home birth and I'm not okay with it and I do not advocate mm-hmm. home births. Mm-hmm. I've seen the baby die, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, whoa, I mm-hmm. don't need this right now. Wow. <laughs> I was just like, no. No, and she just, she put the fear of God into me and I was very polite and I just said, I really thank you for your concern and I thank you for checking on me. I know Mm -hmm. you have a duty of care, you know, um, but I've got this. I'm fine. I said the medical system has had two two chances, two births, and they haven't haven't delivered. So I said, third time's on me. I'm doing it. And she was like, I'm not yep. okay. I don't support this. And I said, you can't stop me. It was a fight on the phone. And she said, you need to be careful because the police can be involved. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm aware. I know. But thank you for your concern. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I need to end this phone call now. And I hung the phone up yep. and that rattled me. It shook me to my absolute core because my little yep. peaceful bubble that I had yep. created just yeah. shattered but see I'd like to add call. you know when I you're cried in a and I was and they say you need to do this you can decline anything 
even basically going against the medical advice, yes. you can decline something. And they usually have, you know, yes. forms for you to sign to say, I've informed the patient of, you know, the risks and blah, blah, blah. And she has declined and then you mm-hmm. sign it. But you have a right to decline anything, and that is exactly yes. what you've done. This GP who wasn't involved this whole time now decides to somehow have an opinion on your birth. Yeah, as you said, I'm I'm hearing you, but I <laughs> don't. You know, this is not what I want. I've heard you don't agree with it. Noted. Perfect. Yes, I had to yeah. be stand. I had to stand really firm in my power. I had to stand really firm and I had to to protect my birthing bubble at all costs and that even meant ending the phone call and saying, Mm. like, thanks for checking on me. I know, like, I know she was coming from a place of concern. Don't get me wrong. I I know that she wasn't calling up seeing how she could wreck my life. She was genuinely, like, genuinely, she probably has never seen an undisturbed birth. So she doesn't have any evidence, just as like I was saying, I didn't have any evidence for the thing that I wanted. She also didn't have any evidence to support the thing that I was advocating for. So her 7 million years of of medical school is telling her this is not possible. This is not possible. You cannot do this. I understood where she was coming from, but it really um, really rocked me. Could she she have called the police on you to say that you were doing something that wasn't safe like she could have there there could easily have Mm -hmm. been if anything went wrong there could have easily been like negligence involved or there could easily be like a claim of neglect like I'm I'm willingly Mm -hmm. neglecting medical Mm -hmm. care for a baby However, at this point, I don't know if anyone is aware, which Mm -hmm. is what happens when you go down the free birth route, is in Australia, our laws work that a woman is a sovereign being and she remains a sovereign being until she gives birth. So she can't, you cannot make decisions about a baby's life if a woman does not agree with it. And that, that can be so extreme to the point of like, your baby will die mm-hmm. if you don't do this medical thing yeah. or you don't have this C-section or have this induction. Yeah. And a woman has the legal right to say, I am my own yes. human and I don't agree with that, regardless of mm-hmm. the potential yeah. or certain outcomes mm. that may happen from that. So a woman is still a sovereign being until she gives birth. And I had to no, know this and that's something that you never know. No one ever tells you that you have the right to advocate for your own person, personal yeah. medical and bodily autonomy. No one tells you that you have mm. that. You have to kind of go down that rabbit hole to learn that. And, you know, I guess a lot of people in the last two years have been acutely aware of that. Yeah with like COVID vaccinations and stuff, people were able to advocate for themselves to say, no, like I know there's probably heaps of evidence of why I should get it, but I get to make the Mm -hmm. final decision about my body and what I want to have happen with my body. This falls into that category. Like regardless, I'm still, until the minute that I, that we become two entities and a baby is born, I am still a sovereign being and I get to make that choice. That's, something that obviously takes a lot of responsibility and takes a lot of gravity and and is a big weight to carry but I still am able to advocate for that so that's what she was alluding to in in the fact that like if anything didn't go wrong I could be in trouble if everything didn't go right sorry that I could Mm -hmm. be in trouble for negligence or refusing medical care yeah that took a lot for me to just go I'm gonna like get this conversation and I'm going to compartmentalize it over here and I am not Mm -hmm. going to let that infiltrate into my sphere and you know it was quite like it was obvious because I lived in a really small town and people saw me really pregnant and every time I'd go in to do my shopping they'd be like oh when are you leaving and sometimes I'd just be like oh I don't know or a couple (laughs) of people I just said I'm not and that's probably how yeah. that that conversation kind of got back to the doctor and then the doctor was like, hang on, I'm just going to yeah. look on here. Oh, Brittany hasn't done anything. Yeah. And so that's how that that happened. So, 
Now, probably, probably wouldn't I was happen going to say you would have fallen through the cracks, town, definitely, but, um, and that would yeah, have been to your are. advantage. <laughs> but, yeah, you can't really fall through the cracks yeah. in a tiny town where everyone knows it. Exactly. Everyone. And I was very calculated and aware that it would be very, very difficult for me to oh, register yes. my baby's birth. And this yep. is another thing that none of us know about because none of us reg- mm-hmm. none of us register our own baby's birth, really. It would be very difficult for me to register my baby's birth if my doctor... Yep had not seen me pregnant. So that's one of the laws in Queensland. Your GP has to have seen you pregnant. So I went at 20 weeks or so, I went for a um, for a referral, not a referral, sorry. I went for, yes, a referral for yep. a physio because I was having sciatic pain. In her records, yep. Brittany is 20 weeks pregnant and she's refer- she's yep, up. Nice. So I did that on purpose because I knew that I needed a record of me being pregnant mm-hmm. somewhere in the system. So that's why she was kind of aware okay. yeah. of me and that's how that happened. However, I put yeah. that in that little box over there and I thought, you know, let's just not worry about that for now. Then Kelly <sighs> drove through the driveway, my doula, she drove up the driveway <laughs> and I cried. And it was the most would have been. relieving experience I've had because, mind you, I'm home alone by myself my husband's out doing whatever the heck he's doing and I had this phone call yep. from his GP and I'm feeling so vulnerable like really 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 vulnerable and then she comes through and I was like we just had these big hugs like Aww. it was so beautiful it was the most the wonderful experience and we my kids were like Aww. they'd made her this big like welcome Aww. sign as well so it was so cool and she, I'm sure, has never never driven to the outback before. So it was such a, like, really cool experience for her. We, like, I showed her her little accommodation and her husband was there and they were like, oh, we all had big dinner and my, hus- my husband came home and we were all, like, big family. It was yeah. so, so lovely. The next day we, like, we set up the birth pool together, like, pumped it all up and we checked the water and I was like, First birth wasn't yeah. allowed to have wasn't allowed to get in the pool because I had Sinto. Second birth couldn't even get in the pool because I wasn't even in the hospital long enough to breathe. So third birth, I'm bloody getting in the pool. Like I was, I was determined. So I'm like, book of the pool set up, like, and had my birth altar yeah. set up. You know, had all the affirmations on the wall, had the medical handbook there, had all these beautiful photos and crystals and flowers and. It was yeah. it was such a beautiful space with all the fairy lights everywhere, and so I was like, right, okay, thirty eight weeks and one day. Tomorrow, I'm due to give yeah. birth because that's the way I've given birth my other okay. two babies. So this is what's going to happen. Anyway, so the next day, we just kind of hung out, and she did like she gave me beautiful facials, she gave me a massage. Mm-hmm. I'm feeling kind of like tight and yeah. kind of crampy but nothing really anyway she had a she bought her yoni throne so I did some yoni steaming so she bought some beautiful like herbs we did some yoni steaming which by the way mm-hmm. you shouldn't do unless birth is imminent just fyi um because it can kind of yeah move things along with the heat and everything like that. And she did some beautiful like acupressure massages for me and sort of like pre-labor ones because I was feeling kind of twingy and stuff. And it was just such a beautiful experience. Like my ki- she was with my kids the whole time as well and her husband was there. Her husband like mowed Thank my you. lawn while we were... <laughs> while we were doing all this kind of stuff and yeah did some gardening for me and she's there just in my kitchen just cooking up like batches and batches and batches of all this food and it was just so beautiful and I remember I went Mm. to sleep that night and I put on this like labor induction medication uh, meditation because I was like I feel ready I feel ready. Douse myself in clary sage. Listen to this labor induction med- meditation as I was going to sleep. Anyway, I woke up the next morning okay. and I had one contraction. I was like, oh, yes, it all worked. Like, <laughs> we're ready. Anyway, oh. nothing happened after that. So I was like, oh, okay, well, that's totally fine. Like, whatever. It's just, just nothing. So we spent the day, again, doing art. Like, we put lots of art all around the birth altar and she's just playing with the kids. And we we're really, like, we we're really getting into the birth zone, you know. And I'd never had this experience before of being able to do all the, the nice birthy things. I've never had that experience because 
like you've heard, it just kind of never really worked. And we just did all of this fun stuff. And there's this uh, lady on um, on YouTube, yep. and I I read her books, and her name's um, Sarah Schmidt, and she's German. She's she was an obstetrician, but she ended up having nine babies. Like she just free birthed them herself. And I read her book, and in in her book, she's like, because she's a medical professional, yep. she like writes really detailed like about the births. And so I'd read her book and then by the time she's up to like baby number six, seven, eight, nine, she um she's uploading them onto YouTube. The last one is a twin. Like she had twins. Her last birth was her ninth, eighth and ninth baby were twins. And she uploaded that birth onto YouTube. And I just remember like my kids were just watching it and I'm just watching it. And it was a really impactful birth for me because to watch. Because he was an obstetrician having her eighth and ninth baby at mm-hmm. like 45 years old and they were twins yeah. and she's just having yeah. them, mm-hmm. just having them at home just with her husband. Her husband's just like, it, they might as well be making a spaghetti bolognese. That's how like chill they were about it. He's just like, oh, here's the, here's the pad for you to like, oh, yeah, your waters are broke. Oh, okay, here's baby number one. Wow. All good. All right. <laughs> And they were just so casual about it. And it was really, yeah, it was so beautiful. And the second baby had heaps of meconium, like, come out before before it was born. And she just looks at the meconium and she's like, oh, this colour is yeah. fine. The subtitles at the bottom, she's like, oh, yeah. this colour is fine. So she, even in, like, her mind, she's like, what we kind of yeah. classify as emergencies, like, oh, my God, meconium emergency, she's like, the colour is fine. Like it just happened probably within the previous 12 hours or whatever and, you know, she she just intuitively and I just remember watching this birth like Definitely. women are amazing. Like this is absolutely yep. insane that she's having twins, one of them's posterior oh, and the other is breech and she's just like yep. Yep. just having it like it's nothing in her house. And I'm like, uh, women are just absolutely amazing. And I remember just being like, whoa, I can do anything. I can do this. And I go for a nap. The kids go for a nap. Kelly goes for a nap. (laughs) I decide to wake up and make jam. For some ridiculous reason, I decide today I need to make some jam. In hindsight, of course, that's like labor brain kicking in. You've got to like do things with your hands to take your mind off the labor I had no idea I didn't have any concept that that's what was happening so I wake up after lunch like make some jam of course and then we all sit down and we have dinner and I just remember it was this beautiful curry like the most amazing curry that that Kelly had cooked and we were all sitting around laughing and joking and having the best time and I was like oh feeling like period painy kind of like but no yeah. contractions just like really achy around my tummy and I'm like oh yeah okay this is a little bit more uncomfortable and then I sort of the way that the pains were coming I was kind of feeling like I needed to hold onto the table it was like maybe feeling like a little bit more achy but definitely nothing like a contraction it was just like oh I feel like I want like a heat pack or something like you know when you get like a really big period pain it was like that I was like I want a heat pack or something on my tummy anyway it was time for the kids to go to bed we'd had dinner and um, my husband's like I'll take them to bed you just chill out you're looking a bit crampy like I'll just take the kids to bed I'm like okay so I walk into the bedroom like night boys I love you we might have a baby in the morning or something I don't know anyway they're like okay good night and for some reason I decide that that's a really the most important time to clean the playroom like I just had this big like rage clean so I'm like on my knees like just chucking stuff everywhere like the play this playroom so messy apparently that's really important that I need to do something about this playroom being so messy so I'm just like and I'm like I'll just chuck this here anyway of course we know now in hindsight you know what that is it's like that whole labor like do the things to like distract you from what's going on anyway so I like walk back into the kitchen I'm like oh just clean the playroom looks so good in there like whoa and Kelly's like she's looking at me like what's going on with you like this is and then I and then all of a sudden I like grabbed the edge of the bench and I was like oh that was was a kind of spicy contraction and I look up and I look at the 
at the clock and I was like oh okay it's Mm -hmm. it's like eight o'clock and I sort of remember being vaguely aware of like the time anyway then I'm like oh here comes something Mm -hmm. that feels exactly like a contraction like I remember and Kelly looked at me like (laughs) I knew what was going on here (laughs) anyway she's like do you want the do you want the yoga ball and I was like yeah maybe I will and I sort of she puts a yoga mat on the floor for me and and gives me the yoga ball while James is in putting the boys to bed and I sort of kneel I felt the need to like kneel on the yoga mat and hold the big yoga ball and then it was on like it that was all I needed it was almost like permission to be like you can be in labor now that was all I needed it was like then they were just the contractions were like a hundred percent there and I I remember like leaning forward on the on the yoga ball like this and um Kelly had she heated up a yeah. heat pack and she had like a rebozo sling and she sort of tied it tied the heat pack like on my back and put the sling like around my tummy and she tied it really tight and that was just so amazing like the most amazing thing I'd ever experienced and she's like doing the washing up and she's just sort of watching me and I'm like whoa this is this is a lot Anyway, she must have decided mm-hmm. to go and get James, and so James just appears. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad that you're here. I don't, I don't. Oh, the kids asleep, and he's like, yeah, the kids are asleep, and he's like, are you having a baby? And I was like, I don't know. Like, I think so. I think this is happening. And he was like, looks at me, looks at Kelly, like she's having a baby now, isn't she? And then all of a sudden, one big like, like. Yeah roaring okay. kind of contraction yeah. and my waters break and I remember I look down and I see oh, I see that the, they're clear and there's a little bit of vernix floating in it on the yoga mat and I was like good so in my yeah. brain I'm still kind of half in my logic brain because I know that like I need to be because I'm a free birther and that's like you know you need good. to be and I like look down I'm like tick fine little like tick on my list like the conium's fine I'm fine we're all fine like everything's happening and James is like do you want to go into the bathroom now we'll like take your undies off and we'll take you towards the birth pool and I was like yeah that's a great idea I basically just like last time hit transition walking from the kitchen to the bathroom to the birth pool so by the time I get to the birth pool I'm like my clothes are off and I'm and
like the most uncontrollable like I was completely not controlling what was going on there was zero pushing and fetal ejection reflex is just coming one after the other after the other after the other and I can't stop it I can barely breathe through it it's just going and going and going anyway I it it stops and I have the the foresight in my mind to be like if I want to catch my own baby I need to be in a different position than what I'm in now because at the moment I'm like squatting in the water like and I don't really feel like I can catch my baby and squat and like hold myself up and so I'm like oh and so I had the weirdest thought of like if you lean back on the birth pool then you'll probably be able to catch your baby so I sort of leaned back with my back of my head against the back of the birth pool and that was enough and then all I had was like probably three more really really massive contractions and I put my hand down there and I remember thinking I can't do this like this is too much I can't go on this is I'm I I cannot do this and I remember thinking oh that's great that I'm having that thought because I know that means that I'm just about to meet my baby when I think I can't do it that's when I know so I was like tick I was like ticking these little tick tick boxes off in my brain as I was going along and I put my finger inside my vagina and I feel what feels like a squishy wet kiwi fruit and there was a part of my brain that was like that's not what a head is supposed to feel like it doesn't feel like a squishy kiwi fruit but I do remember I had listened to so many podcasts of women describing when they put their fingers up there and it feels like a squishy wet kiwi fruit Mm -hmm. And I was literally like, oh, that's exactly what I'm feeling. It's a squishy wet kiwi fruit. It must be the head. But if I didn't know that and I hadn't have heard that, I probably would have freaked out and been like, what the actual heck am I feeling right now inside Mm -hmm. my body? Because it does definitely not feel like what I expect the baby's head to feel like. It's all like mushy and weird. Anyway, so I'm like, right, okay, we're good. We're good. This is all ticking along just perfectly. I remember I one last contraction and the head came out and I'm like, don't rush this. Don't rush it. Because the last time when this happened, when I was in the hospital and the like my baby is rushing to come out I'm like pushing I'm just pushing because I'm so I'm so full of adrenaline and I'm scared and I and and this is all happening to me and I'm like it's chaos Mm -hmm. and this time I remember thinking be still just be still Brittany be still and I thought okay is the weirdest feeling to be sitting Mm, in a bird pool with a baby's (laughs) head out of your vagina and that's it and to not want to force it to not want to do anything to make it happen Anyway, I took a breath and another breath and then all of a sudden he turned just by himself. He just he kicks inside of me and I feel this like this like kind of like click kind of thing. He clicks inside of me and then there's nothing. I'm like, all right. And then another contraction hits and he just slides right out. And I'm like, Whoa! That is insane. <gasps> and he turned himself like he just turns himself and like he just comes right out and I didn't yeah. obviously didn't know that I was having a baby a boy or anything like that I, I grab him and I immediately wow. look down and I know he's fine like I just know it I know he's fine his little his little mouth yeah. is like moving but he's not stressed yeah. no one's stressed and look down and, and my husband is like right there like his face is like right there and he and he's like he watched the whole thing and and he's just crying and he's like, it's a boy, it's a boy, it's a, it's a boy, like three boys, like got three boys. And I'm just so happy. And there was never a moment where I was yeah. like, oh, my God, this is emergency, like my baby's out, now what? I was just like, oh, this is just so amazing. And he's fine because I could see his little, like, face moving and his mouth yeah. was, like, moving and there was no struggle or anything. And I just kind of held him and I was like, hi. I'm here and within I don't know 20 seconds maybe he just makes a little sound and then he cries and it's yeah fine (laughs) and I just had a baby and it's completely fine and and like he was fine and and I knew it was fine like it was and I looked at (gasps) Kelly looked at the clock and it was nine o'clock so from the time I looked at the, the clock at eight when I was like, oh, that's like, and I got down on yeah. the on the oh. yoga mat 
It was nine wow. o'clock when he was born. <laughs> I went through that whole insane process like I went through with my second birth. However, at not one time did I yep. feel like this yep. is wrong, this is out of control, I can't do this, Um, this is this is happening wow. to me, oh, my God, I feel like I've been hit by nothing. It, yep. Because I was exactly where I needed to be, I was so comfortable, I was so like not yep. in control I was in complete surrender wow. and I was completely fine with it yep. because I was safe I was three yep. seconds away from where I needed to give birth and I was just happy and I looked down I remember looking down in the birth pool yep. to assess my blood loss mm-hmm. and there was blood like quite a bit of blood in the pool and I was like mm-hmm. how do I feel I'm like I feel fine. I don't feel woozy or anything like that. But the water was really hot and it was making me uncomfortable. And I was holding my baby like up out of the hot water. Mm. And I was like, I need to get out of this bath because I'm not, I'm not happy with, with how I'm feeling. So I was like, Mm. I was starting to feel like sweaty. I'm like, can someone get me out? So they both kind of helped me out. And I still hadn't birthed a placenta at this time. And I and I looked back and I looked in the pool and I and I was like, there's a lot of blood there. I'm like, how do I feel? No, I still feel good. I still I don't feel lightheaded. I don't and I had I had lots of tinctures on hand. I'd gone to Blissful Herbs and I had bought the no bleed tincture, I'd bought the hemorrhage tincture, I'd bought all the tinctures that was needed. And Kelly also bought heaps of homeopathics and she had some like hardcore you know, hemorrhage homeopathics. She had some placenta release homeopathics and stuff like that. So I felt like I had heaps of stuff on board if I needed it. But right at that moment, I didn't feel like I needed anything. And in my brain, I also knew my placenta was still attached. So there was nothing Mm -hmm. really to bleed at this stage because my placenta still hadn't come away. And like two steps away from Mm -hmm. the birth pool was a bed that I had set up. And it was just the most beautiful thing in the world to just lay in a nice bed of my own. And I was like, I'm just going to let my placenta come away. James went and woke up the boys and they like came over and they're like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And they all like came over and we all had big cuddles. And and Eli was what I named my third baby. And Eli was there and we were like, I was thinking if I Mm. feed him, maybe that'll help me get my placenta out. Because by then I was so uncomfortable I was like this placenta needs to get out because it feels like a broomstick Mm. up my vagina it felt so uncomfortable I'm like I couldn't really sit with it and it was like oh and I started to get kind of like I need to get this out and I had done a lot of research on like third stage so I knew there was a massive Mm -hmm. variation of normal of third stage and I was like okay well what do we do now And I'm like, we need to surrender to this experience. So I said, I'm going to feed him, nothing happened. I'm going to massage my belly, nothing happened. I'm going to go to the toilet, nothing happened. And I thought, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready for this placenta to be out. However, I had read lots and lots of stories of women that had just gone to bed with their placenta, just literally gone to bed and not birthed their placenta and woke up (laughs) and stood up and birth their placenta because their placenta just come away while they were sleeping. I'm like, well, I probably could yeah. do that, but I don't actually want mm. to because I'm not enjoying this experience mm. of having an umbilical cord hanging out of me. And this is something that I don't think a lot of people take a lot of, they don't take any notice of because yeah. usually it's just syntocin, bang, your placenta's out within, I think the hospital policy is within 20 minutes. The placenta has to be out within 20 minutes. Otherwise, it's an emergency. And we do know that retained placenta is an issue. So I'm aware of that at this time. Yeah. I'm like, how do I get out this placenta out? And then I'm starting to put oh, yeah. gentle traction on my umbilical cord. Mm-hmm. And no, nah, yeah. it feels like it's stuck solid. And I'm like, right, okay, what do I do now? I want to get this out. And I, I started to get a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit like I don't feel okay about my placenta still being inside me I don't know why it's been inside me for so bloody long it can stay in there for a little bit longer I said to Kelly do you mind if I take some placenta release tincture and she was like no no so she brings it over she puts it under my tongue nothing happened Mm -hmm. puts it under my tongue again nothing happened and she said would you be open to trying a homeopathic and I was like, yeah, whatever, whatever you need to do to get this placenta out of me, I'm, I'm down with. 
Anyway, one tiny, tiny, tiny pillule that's like the size of a Mm -hmm. sewing, like a needle head, she puts under my tongue and within two seconds my placenta is out. It just completely (laughs) filled off, just comes out. And she had what she'd done, she said, I'll give you she, she said, I'll give you this. And then she said, I'll just go out and I'll make you a cup of tea. And she knew, I think she knew, yeah. but she knew that I needed to be alone and that I needed to be like comfortable. So she gave me mm-hmm. under my tongue, she gave yeah. me the little pillule and she left the room. The minute she left the room, I had one contraction and our placenta came out. Funnily enough, it came out and she wasn't there. So if this isn't true love, James just reaches down underneath me with picks up my placenta in his hands <laughs> and puts it in the bowl that I had prepared there. And I looked at him and he's like, that is true love. And I was like, that is true love. I love you so much. I couldn't love you any more in this moment than you holding the placenta that I have just that birthed is so beautiful. in that your hair. <laughs> Yeah, it was the most beautiful. It was the most beautiful experience, and and he puts it in the in the bowl, and then Kelly comes back in, and she's like, "Oh, well, look at that!" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh yeah." She hands me a cup of tea. I have a cup of tea, and the boys are kind of all my boys are all around me, and we're all cuddling. And then it was so beautiful. Yeah. She, we did a cord burning ceremony, so I had this beautiful oh, crocheted yes. umbilical tie that my mother-in-law had crocheted for me so it had this beautiful sentiment she didn't know why she was crocheting it but she did it anyway um because I definitely didn't tell her what I was doing (laughs) and yeah I tied that off and then we we burnt the cord if anyone hasn't heard of a cord burning ceremony it's just like a little wooden box and everybody gets a candle and everybody like so my boys all got a candle and we we like burnt held the candle underneath the cord until it basically severed and then the placenta went into a bowl there and the um, rest of the umbilical cord went into a bowl and that was about an hour after birth so I she looked and the time of the placenta being born was Mm -hmm. 10 so my baby was born at nine my placenta was born at 10 and then we did the cord burning ceremony and then I had a shower and we like, I had a cup of tea. The boys boys went back to bed. Kelly tucked me into bed. And at 11 o'clock, Amazing. we yeah. all just went to bed. And that was it. And it was the most magical experience yeah. to be in my own bed around my family, to have that experience yeah. with my boys and my husband and to be cuddled up with my newborn in bed like it was so right it felt so right like oh this is how it's supposed to be this is how birth is supposed to this is how it's supposed to happen and yeah the next morning I like woke up and James woke up and he's like how how do you feel I'm like I feel amazing how do you feel and he's like I feel amazing and we kind of like did this we tried to like weigh the baby with some fish scales Mm. and they weren't really working and then so I was like well maybe if I put him on my thermomix we could get a weight we kind of got like a but it it didn't matter like it who cares how much the baby weighed no one cares because it's like it feels kind of just like a bit of bragging rights to be like how long is your baby how how heavy is your baby what's the size size of his head and like all this kind of stuff I'm like we don't have to worry about any of that because the fact that whether he was however many kilos or not however many kilos didn't actually change the fact that he was already born and he was already fine and I knew that he was fine because I could see his color and and he was feeding like a champion like his nappy output was totally fine like I knew this as his mother I didn't need like to be to be weighed or like anything for me to know that he was okay like I just had like a tiny 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 little labial tear and um, I decided not to get that stitched because I was like, well, I'm sure it'll be fine if I just rest and keep yeah. my legs together. And it was. Funnily enough, oh. he was my biggest baby by like weight and size and stuff like that. And yep. 
I tore the least yep. with him and mm -hmm. even though he was quite fast and there's some variables there about mm -hmm. like being in water helps with no not tearing and stuff like that but I feel like it was also because I was fully engaged and present and or none of the hormonal processes yeah. that needed to happen were interrupted at any stage like birth just happened exactly how it needed to happen and nobody yeah. nobody messed with it like it yeah. just it just was what it was as okay. though it was a precipitous labor again no. it wasn't a drama like it was completely fine yeah. I had everything pre prepared and I had everything there and I was completely I wasn't in control but I was at peace Whereas in any other precipitous labour, like my last mm. was just absolute panic stations. There yeah. was no panic. Not one second was there any panic. Yeah, I just, then we just had a baby and then we just continued along and Kelly nice. encapsulated my placenta for me. So yeah. so I got to experience that and her husband cleaned out Amazing. the birth pool for me, like, yeah, yeah. and put it on my garden. Yeah, like it was, it was just, it felt so natural and so normal. And yeah, I just, I went to the doctor like four or five days later, maybe, which I didn't want to do. But I also know yeah. knew I was anxious about the registration process. And I had researched the registration process enough to know that, like, stat deck from my husband stat deck from me I researched the birth deaths and marriages process and I knew that the yeah. doctor couldn't deny me so I went in there and I'm like and the first thing she said to me was oh you both made it then <laughs> so she wasn't That's like shocking to was say that like she was kind like, of happy for like, me she was oh, I more didn't like think you would. yeah said I was starting to worry I hadn't heard anything and I was like yeah. well it wasn't my duty to tell you either because this is yeah. a completely non-medical process yeah. what I just experienced this was like a spiritual and a and this was like a natural process that did not need you to be aware of I was starting to worry because I hadn't heard anything and I know that she didn't trust birth and she has reasons not to trust birth I didn't feel the need to inform her and to actually have a have a birth completely away from the medical system and be like, actually, all the interventions that we did or could have done or yep, normally do, fine. the birth just happens anyway, <laughs> regardless of whether you have the checks or the not checks or the, it just ends up, yep. you still end up giving birth at the end of the day. And in my case, I gave birth in the most ecstatic and empowering and like mm -hmm. the most sacred way. Yeah. because I did stay away from everybody else telling me what I needed and what I should do and the driving and the tests and the checks and the this and the that. And because I chose not to have those, yeah. then I got to choose the outcome that I had. Yeah. I wasn't just like the passenger in this kind of weird vortex of a system. I actually created all of that. I created that. I chose it. I manifested it. I saw it. I I knew it, and so it so was. inspiring. That is, it it just sounds, you know, beautiful, sacred. I think sacred is is the term I was looking for, and that's what you just said. It sounds healing as well because you were, as you said, you were not in control. Yes, but you surrendered. You trusted everything. You trusted your environment, the process everything that was happening yes. and it's so good that when the head came out of of when Eli's head came out you remembered to to pause and because that would be so hard with the fetal ejection reflex and you just went okay I need to I need to breathe I need to be present and then he just came out like as you said rotated yeah. and then pushed himself out like like he would have because yes. he wasn't disturbed. There wasn't anyone yes. trying to grab him or going, oh, he need, his body needs to come out right now. No, he no. Did, didn't need to come out. He came out on his own terms when he was ready and when your body was ready. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, and you know what? Like birth just happens and by somebody pulling him, yeah. it wouldn't have changed the fact that he ended up being born. Mm. Like he still was born and there was no... There was no problem. And I think because I was empowered with the knowledge of like he doesn't have to get his mouth out and he doesn't yeah. have to breathe straight away because I know that babies don't breathe through their mouth. They breathe through their placenta. Like that 
also because I have that knowledge, yeah. I had it because I went looking for it. Yeah. I was like, it's mm. okay. It's okay that his mouth is under the water and he's not actually using it. It's it's okay. And this is the way it's supposed to happen. It honestly was like this most surreal thing to almost like an out-of-body experience, like watch a birth, an undisturbed birth, and it was just happened to me mine that I was watching. And at no time did I ever feel like this is wrong or that I shouldn't be doing this or this is bad. There was at no time did, that is did amazing. I feel that I, I'm so happy for you. It it just just like it was meant to. It sounded all amazing and so beautiful and, and it happened, you know, she said that the timing was perfect, but but I mean you were in your own environment, you know, it was probably going to be that way anyway. It oh, it just all sounds so so amazing, peaceful. Yeah. You know, that that peacefulness of no one being rushed or help supporting you and then standing back when, you know, or worried or anxious and and just watching you yes. and helping you where where you needed that wasn't needed and just just watching you give birth amazing that is amazing the the definition of undisturbed birth yes and james and kelly like they like revered me like i knew i was the power i was the Mm -hmm. absolute Mm -hmm. knowledge holder in that moment they both trusted me absolutely completely that i knew and i was the authority in the room at no point yep. was anyone telling me what to do or like I was the one that was yep. telling them or I didn't tell anyone anything. I didn't even use any words. I didn't have to. But it was like at no time did I ever feel like I was a child in that moment. I was the one completely and and they were both like in awe just watching me just be this birthing absolute in like amazing goddess and they were just totally okay with that. At no point was anyone like, oh, is she okay? Like, do we need to, like, direct her or does she need help? There was no, at no time yeah. did they be like, we need to save Brittany from this thing that's happening to her. They were just like, this is amazing. Like, I can't believe that she's, that this is even happening. Like, for them it was just this, like, sacred experience yeah. as well. And I think every dad yeah. needs to experience that. Every father needs to know that birth is not yep. something that they need to save their women from. Birth is something yep. that they need to like worship, that they need to look at and go like, wow, my yep. woman is amazing. And not kind of like yep. the way that James pulled me out of birth after my first birth, it was like he was pulling me out, like a soldier out of the trench. Like I was absolutely yeah. wrecked. After my third birth, he's like, I bowed down to you. You are like infinitely powerful and infinitely yeah. amazing. And it has it has changed our relationship. It has changed my life after yeah. this because I am I'm so empowered in every decision that I make. I'm so sure. It has flowed like Rachel Reed in her book when she talks about childbirth as a rite of passage definitely has been a rite of passage for me because now I I'm embodying like a true powerful woman like a sovereign woman and there is a small part of this like weird part of my conspiracy brain is like is there a reason why people don't want women to feel birth like this because mate we would be unmess withable if we all experience a birth like that we would be powerful we would be sure we would be like and um, we would be a force to be reckoned with if all women experience births like that because the the woman that i have become since that birth my business has has absolutely boomed exponentially my my relationships with my friends and my family have like grown into this much deeper and much more powerful way my relationship with my husband has gone into this next amazing level I'm like wow imagine if everyone got to experience life this way like it didn't untouch any aspect of my life all aspects of my life were completely touched by that experience and my wish is that more women could know that it could be so easy like a little bit boring 
Like, it also was just, a like, as much as it was heavenly and, like, like transcendental, it was also kind of just, like, doing a poo. Like, it was just a little bit, like, I just, like, pushed and then, like, a baby came out and yeah. that's actually what bodies are supposed to do and it's just, just like, this weird, yeah. almost, like, bodily function that was just really kind of straightforward and, like, yes, tick, that happened, yes, tick, that happened. So, again, the duality of being a woman and the duality of experience was like, oh, my God, like, that was so empowering and amazing. And also that was just literally so textbook and boring That's that it was so almost funny nothing. That's put it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it shouldn't have, yeah, like, it shouldn't be this, like, like big traumatic, like, it's life-changing, yeah. but it's also just really normal, like, so normal yeah. that it's, like, breathing. Yeah. Because your body just does it anyway. It's like you don't really think about, like, the <laughs> process of, of doing a poo. Well, it, it, it's kind of that. Like, it just happened anyway. And, yeah, so, again, like I talked about, you can you can hold both of those experiences in the one hand. Um, I'm also a little bit like, yeah, and, like, so, also, it was just went to bed. And, yeah, no, you, you, like, you're yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I it's, mean, it, it's it is. It's nuts. It is a bodily function, and, and as you said, I mean, when you do birth, there is a similarity to pooping that is true. Well, I mean, when, when you're in a hospital, yeah. they say, oh, you know, push yeah. as if you were trying to do a big poo, basically. So, I mean, yes. <laughs> and, and, I mean, you know, mm. again, undisturbed birth, it would happen to a woman in a coma. So even though she's not conscious her body yes. would expel this baby out of her. So it's it's just a body mm-hmm. function. We're, we're born as women with disability yeah. to just expel a baby, basically. You know, all things going well, obviously. I mean, sometimes yes. if you've got different positioning of the baby, that can have an impact and there might be some, you know, changes in position that might be needed. But for the most part, it is just, it can be straightforward and not, need much of anything to be done i mean you could have birthed on the yoga mat but you wanted to be in the water so therefore you just moved yourself and yeah you could have birthed anywhere at this point (laughs) because your body was just ready for it and was just yeah it it was like oh Brittany, even if you don't want it to happen well i am doing it (laughs) i am your body i am doing it right now Exactly. And, you know, with this, like, amazing free birth that I experienced, I experienced a lot of grief afterwards with it as well because it made me realise what Mm -hmm. was robbed from me the Mm -hmm. first two times. And it was was robbed from me also Mm -hmm. because of my own choices and I don't want to be like someone did this to me because I also Mm -hmm. willingly went along with the process mm-hmm. and I did not educate myself in birth. I would have mm-hmm. had no idea about, about how my body worked. It was a little bit like fertility. Like I was just like, yeah. how do you get pregnant? I don't know. So like I, but I grieve because I, I, I think back yeah. now to baby one, Brittany, my first birth with my first baby, Austin. And I think, imagine if she was like allowed, her body was allowed to open yeah. as it was meant to open and imagine if if she had like the knowledge around positioning and yeah. imagine if that birth could have unfolded in the exact hands-off way that my second as absolutely adrenaline filled and panic stations as it was it still unfolded yeah like as it was meant to be imagine if I hadn't left home mm-hmm. At the right. minute my waters broke. Imagine if I hadn't yeah. gone for an hour and a half drive. Imagine if I hadn't yeah. been stuck in a room alone with fluoro yeah. lights on with no support and no one checking on me. Imagine yeah. if I hadn't That's have right. had the Sinto that sped up the contractions to the point where my posterior baby was like being forced out of my body at a yeah. rate that my body couldn't expand. Imagine if I hadn't been told to push two hours early and I'm mm. pushing for two hours with a cervical lip. Yeah. Like like it just as much as my my free birth was so healing and so amazing, the, with yeah. knowledge comes extreme grief because now yeah. I know what I what I lost those first yeah. two times. 
and what I could have had. And a lot of people say, oh, no, but you probably couldn't have had a free birth for your first. And I definitely, definitely refute Mm. that. I really do refute it because because I I'm still me and although my body had given birth you know three to, well two times by the time of my third yeah. it's still the same body with exactly the same processes and exactly the same yeah. hormones I just didn't have That's the right. knowledge or the power or the right provider or anything and so again like I said the duality of those experiences yeah. the absolute high and ecstasy that I felt again I felt deep sorrow for myself my first person and all women that I see that do not get to experience this and that leave the birth feeling ripped off and sore and broken and traumatized and depressed and probably don't go on to have another baby because of that that initial experience and the worst are the ones that leave the hospital yeah. thinking that that's just how birth is. And yeah. that breaks my heart because yeah. they go and tell their daughters and their friends about how awful and this experience and this ordeal is. And then more women go into birth thinking it's just yeah. something that they hope goes well but probably just doesn't. And it. I have deep sorrow now for those that do not get yeah, to experience no, what right. I got to experience. It, it, as much as I feel yeah, ecstasy, right. I feel sadness as well, which is why I'm, I am a birth advocate. Like now I, I, I will tell anybody <laughs> that will listen. And I have guided just through my own experiences a few mm-hmm. women to free birth their first babies just like that beautiful friend that guided me through sharing her pictures and her stories and her wow. her big post bag full of books, yep. I now have done the same for quite a few women who have gone on to free birth their first yep. babies. And so maybe in a small way yep. I have healed that first birth, Brittany, by yep. seeing that that is possible for them. And no. I'll never get it back and you never get your first time back and that's something that I really want to impress on people. Your first birth isn't a trial run. It's not something that you're just going to be like, oh, I'm just going to practice. I'm just going to throw it in the hands of of someone else and hope that it goes well and and maybe on my second or my third I'll have a home birth or a free birth or whatever. Your first birth matters. It really, really, really matters and I really wish more people were aware of that. Wow, um, you've just said it all, and and I think that's a good way to <laughs> to um, finish the episode because yeah, it's you can do anything you want, and it does come down to trusting yourself and yes. also having the knowledge. But it is possible to do anything you want, and if if you want yep. you're on an obstetrician for your first birth, and that's what feels right so be it. You know, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to fight the system. If you want to be in the system, that is totally fine. But it's about knowing what choices are available to you. And sometimes you do need a little bit of a push to do something that looks at the moment, maybe a bit scary or daunting. But yes, of course, any woman can do it yeah and my advice is just for anyone preparing for any type of birth does not you don't have to be preparing for a free birth is go and listen to podcasts like this one go and listen to podcasts of people that that have the births that you want so listen to as many go go and look at my birth I, I uploaded my birth onto YouTube you can go and watch it like yeah, you can go and see it and yeah. and of all the other resources and births that I that I recommended, go and and watch oh, what yeah. births Send can be the understood. Link. Because I'll there's put heaps the of different notes. births on YouTube. I will. Yeah. There's so many births out there and there's lots of births you can watch yeah. on YouTube that aren't great. And I and yeah. I recommend don't watch mm, those yeah. because you need to be filling your brain with certainty and yeah. evidence to support the outcome that you want. Surround yourself with people that talk yeah. about birth true. in the results that you want and be very, that very discerning true. who you allow in your circle. Yeah. So that's my advice. Seek out all of the uh, the right stuff. You want to be feeding your body with the right food when you're pregnant? 
you want to be feeding your your brain with the right food when you're pregnant as well and that means resources yeah. stories mindset yeah, amazing and that's Beautiful that's my, my biggest to, advice. to watch it as well and thank you so much for your time this morning you're very welcome thank you so much for for having me and um yeah i i really really appreciate it it, it feels really great to talk about free birth in not like hushed tones <laughs> so it's great <laughs> Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to get notified of when a new episode comes out, please subscribe to this show on your podcast listening platform. Also, I would really appreciate it if you could leave me a review on Apple Podcast or share this episode so that other mom can find it. If you would like to tell your own pregnancy, birth or parenting story, please head to the show notes and you will find a form there to get in touch with me. Again, thank you so much for listening and I will be with you again next week for a new episode.